Hello and welcome. My name is William Wesley. I'm an author, I'm a top performance coach, and I'm a management trainer. But today I'm here to talk about the propositions. And today my guest is our state's legislative analyst, Mr. Mac Taylor. Mac, welcome. Nice to be with you. Glad to have you. Well, last year, Mac and I got together and we actually covered the propositions from last year's election. And we decided, since we had so much fun, to do it again. So today we're going to talk about the 11 propositions that are on this November ballot. So if you're home, get a pen and paper, call your friends. Maybe you've read your guide, maybe you haven't, but hopefully we'll give you some insight and help you make an intelligent decision. So Mac, again, welcome. We only have 11 propositions this year, so we're going to take them from the top and see what they're about. Okay. So Proposition 1. Tell us about Proposition 1. Well, Proposition 1 is a $4 billion housing bond act. Mm -hmm. And the reason that the people have to vote on this, the legislature passed it, but the state constitution requires that voters also approve any new liabilities that are taking on. So that's why the, it's in front of the people. Got it. It's a legislative act as opposed to an initiative brought by the, the people. Exactly. Okay. And so this $4 billion would be spent on various purposes. There's a, a figure on your screen that shows how that money is allocated. Mm -hmm. Of the $4 billion, uh, a big chunk goes for multifamily housing for low-income people. Mm -hmm. Another chunk goes for homeowner assistance to low and moderate income people. Mm -hmm. There's also a billion dollars for veterans. It helps subsidize those loans for veterans. That part of the money typically has no cost to the state because the veterans pay back through their monthly mortgage payments enough to cover the cost. The other $3 billion, however, are a cost to the state. Mm -hmm. In order to pay off the bonds that the state borrows to have this money up front, right, right. it has to, just like a mortgage, exactly. it has to make yearly payments for 25 to 30 years, and that will cost the state about $170 million a year. And that's money that otherwise can't be spent on other things the legislature Got might it. want to. So you're referring to the interest payments they pay to the folks who invest in the bonds. Interest and principal. Got it. Got it. And that's pretty much Proposition 1. Okay. So it sounds good. It sounds like something we need. So I was looking to find out who supports this in the California League of Cities, the County Supervisor Associations, Habitat for Humanity. And then I was looking to see who opposes it. And we have, since it's essentially a tax, we have the Howard Jarvis Taxpayers Association. Well, it, it, and to be clear, it's not really a tax because when you have a bond, it has to be paid off from existing revenues. The measure mm -hmm. itself doesn't provide any new revenues. Okay, so it's a general obligation it's bond. It's just a general obligation bond that has to be paid from whatever revenues the state has. So the choice for people is do they feel like that $170 million in annual debt service, what am I giving up? What can't I spend that $170 million on? Exactly. Because it's going to the debt service. Got it. Well done, sir. Proposition 2. Now, Proposition 2, as I understand, has something to do with the millionaire tax. Now, my first question about that is that tax was passed in 2004. Yes. And what it simply said was after a certain amount of money, there was a 1% tax on those who make a huge amount of money. And please expand on that. But since 2004, we've been collecting that money. Yes. So this initiative says we now want to spend the money, but I guess I first want to ask, where's the money? Well, the money that you referred to from this tax on very high income people, <clears throat> it raises a, anywhere between one and a half to two and a half billion a year. Okay. It varies so much because the income of high income people can right. vary depending on where we are in the business cycle. Mm -hmm. So that money, this, whatever's raised, has to be dedicated for county mental health services. Okay. So what happened, let's fast forward from 2004 to 2016. Mm -hmm. The legislature said, let's take a piece of that money that we just talked about that right. comes in annually, and let's use it to pay off $2 billion in bonds. And we wanna take that bond money and use it for housing for the mentally ill, homeless, or at risk of being homeless. Mm -hmm. And that would probably take about $120, $130 million a year to pay off that $2 billion Got it. in bonds. So really all it's doing, the legislature had this program to say, we're just gonna use a piece of those monies to help the mentally ill in a different way than it was being used. 
In order to do that program, though, you had to have the courts come in and say, it's okay for you to issue those bonds, exactly, and it's okay to use those monies for this purpose. And rather than waiting for the courts that have been hearing that decision, the legislature and the governor just said, let's put the measure in front of the front people, of the people. Exactly. to say, is it okay for us to do this program, it's called the No Place Like Home mm -hmm. program, mm -hmm. in order to issue that $2 billion in bonds. Mm -hmm. So the fiscal effect of the measure is simply, do we want to take a small piece of that one and a half to two and a half billion dollars a year mm -hmm. and have debt service to go for this housing for mentally ill people? Got it, got it. And as I cruise through the different sites, I see no opposition and I also see no specific support. There's not an organization stepping up saying, hey, we're really for this. So it's pretty much in front of the people and the people will make the decision. Proposition three. Another bond act. Mm -hmm. This one, however, wasn't put on by the legislature. It was done through initiative. So it's an $8.9 billion water bond, water and environmental purposes. Mm -hmm. um, people may remember in June of this year of 2018, they voted on a $4 billion bond that was put on by the legislature. This was done through an initiative process. So it's in addition to the bond that was just approved. The $9 billion would be spent on a variety of purposes. There's a figure on your screen that gives a real uh, general outline of the way those funds would be allocated. Mm -hmm. But basically, you can think about it as being for almost anything water related. Mm -hmm. It could help on a watershed by thinning out forest. Mm -hmm. It could repair a levee. Mm -hmm. It could be used to improve drinking water facilities run by cities mm -hmm. or sewage systems. So just a whole array of purposes. Most of the money, uh, will be distributed to local governments because a lot of our water services are provided through local water agencies. Absolutely. And a small portion of the money would have to be matched at the local level. So the fiscal effect of this bond, again, like the others, it's on the annual debt service, which could, after all, most of the bonds are sold, be $430 million a year. So again, it, the measure doesn't raise money, of our general fund, state general fund revenues, it mm -hmm. just means that that much will have to be spent each year and it won't be available for other things. Got it. So how does it relate to the four billion that was already allocated for? Similar, but just different purposes. Okay. Many of the funds are designated for specific entities mm -hmm. or specific purposes and folks would have to go into more detail uh, to sort of know what all of those allocations are because there's a lot of them. Okay, so the supporters here, Ducks Unlimited, California, Waterfowl Association and the Wildlife Association. No opposition registered at this point. Um, again, it's just the issue is debt service. The issue is how much of our general fund do we want to put in this space in terms of water? Mm -hmm. And the whole idea of opportunity cost, meaning if I spend here, I can't spend there. That's well put. Yeah. yeah. Okay, let's talk about Proposition 4 which talks to children's hospitals. This is our last bond issue. Okay. This was done by an initiative, not by the legislature. There are basically 13 hospitals throughout the state that are called children's hospitals. Mm -hmm. And these are hospitals that really specialize in very severe and complex children's diseases and conditions, whether it's uh, congenital or otherwise. Mm -hmm. And um, the voters in the past have approved measures. Back in 2004, they approved 750 million. And in 2008, they approved 980 million. Mm -hmm. These dollars would go for various capital. They could improve and renovate existing facilities or expand their existing facilities. And I believe we have a figure on the screen that will show people how those are allocated. Uh, each of the eight nonprofit children's hospitals would get 135 million each and each of the five University of California hospitals would get $54 million each. And there's a small amount of money that could go to other hospitals that, while they're not designated as children's hospitals per se, they do prov uh, provide a lot of services to them and would be eligible for grants. Okay. And is it the fact that, are these hospitals basically hurting in terms of without this bill or without this money, these hospitals will end up where? Doing I think what? they would have to raise the money from other, other sources. sources or they wouldn't be able to expand. Mm -hmm. So that's really an issue, uh, that, uh, one of the things that I think voters would have to take into account. Mm -hmm. Again, as far as the debt service, mm -hmm. on this 
$1.5 billion in bonds, mm -hmm. it would be about $80 million a year for roughly 30, 35 years. Got it. And you mentioned prior expenditures. Were those capital expenditures yes. too? Okay. Yes, they so were. So that, those funds are exhausted? Pretty much, almost all of them have been spent okay. or committed. And historically, we support those hospitals periodically with this type of... We, again, we have, the voters have, right. most of their money is raised privately, mm -hmm. um, ex especially for the nonprofits. Mm -hmm. um, so this is just a, as you say, it's an opportunity cost. Is mm -hmm. this a high enough priority versus the other ways that we might use the monies? Okay, so we've talked about Proposition 1, that's $4 billion in bonds. Proposition 2 authorizes probably another $2 billion for the program, then another almost $9 billion in Proposition 3, and then $1.5 billion here. What would be your ballpark in terms of the debt service if we put all those together? Yeah, you know, I didn't add that up, but it's probably close to, what, Nine hundred, uh, nine hundred, eight or nine hundred so million dollars a year in annual debt service. Got it, and that comes out of our general. So these are general obligation bonds, which says based on whatever the state has, it pays with, as opposed to a specific revenue bond. Exactly. Okay. Okay. Now, no opposition for Proposition Four, as far as what we see at this point, but we see not but, but in addition for support, we have Children's Hospital Association plus the eight children's hospitals who would be funded uh, by the measure. Let's talk Prop 5. Prop 5 mm -hmm. deals with property taxation for certain individuals, primarily people 55 and older. Mm -hmm. My group, mm -hmm. I, I don't know about yours, William. You look way too young to be eligible for this. Mm -hmm. But let me give it a little background because this one okay. gets a little complicated and you help me if I'm, getting, if I'm going into too much detail. Absolutely. Okay? If you own a home, you obviously pay property taxes on mm -hmm. it. And the property taxes are based on not what the home is worth out on the market, mm -hmm. but what we'll the call taxable value. or assessed value. Mm -hmm. So let's say that I bought a home in Solano 15 years ago and I paid $200,000 for mm -hmm. it. Well, that home could easily be worth 500,000 exactly. today. But my taxable value might only be 250,000 mm -hmm. because of Proposition 13, which limits the annual increases that you pay in your property taxes. Right, right. Now, if I go out and buy a new home, I have to now pay taxes on that market value of the home. I could buy exactly the same home that I'm in mm -hmm. across the street and my taxes would go up mm -hmm. because that's just the way that we do things. Right, right. Now, so under- So it's the current assessed value it's, it's of based the on, new property you purchase. Now, before we even talk about Prop 5, there is a program, however, there is provisions in the Constitution that if I'm 55 years or older, I'm living in Solano, I can move within the county to a home that's no, it can't be market value of more than what my home currently is valued. And I can carry my lower assessed value into that new home mm -hmm. and avoid paying higher property taxes. Currently. Currently. Right. But it has to be within the county. Mm -hmm. I can only do it once and I can't have a home that's more expensive than the home I'm currently in. Do we see a lot of people doing that? Not tons. Okay. Um, you might have a lot of people who would move from a larger house after they retire to a smaller. Mm -hmm. So it definitely does happen. Now, let's, what would Prop 5 do? Prop 5 would, in effect, expand those exemptions to have it apply in more cases. So now, if I'm 55 or older, I don't have to move to Solano. I can move anywhere in the state, and I can take my property value, that lower property assessed value, to my new home. So now your my... property assessed value, or the tax as resulting from it, is portable. It's portable, you keep that lower value, you don't have this increase in property taxes. Mm -hmm. And so it applies it more broadly. I can also buy a more expensive home. And it's a kind of a complicated formula. You'd have to go into the voter guide to get the specifics. But basically, exactly what you say, you sort of carry your existing assessed value, okay. something close to that. Something close to that. To your new if I go home. from two million to a million, that new assessed value, it's still- You'd have to look at the formula exactly, right. but the principle is you get to carry and keep mm -hmm pretty much your lower base assessed value. And that yeah. would cost a lot of money to do because a lot of people move now that are paying those high prices, now they'll have lower property taxes. We estimate that in the near term, it could cost schools and other local governments each up to $100 million a year, but it grows over time to as much as a billion dollars each for schools and local governments over time. The state has to backfill those school losses pretty much, so it'd be a state cost of almost $1 billion a year over time. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, so you have folks who really think this is a great idea, and you have some folks who don't. As we look at that, the net effect to the individual, though, that net effect, have we ballparked that if we take an average well, home in California, whatever that number is now? You know, what does we, that mean to the individual? Yeah, I mean, it could be thousands of dollars in savings, obviously, mm -hmm. with home prices what they are. Mm -hmm. And what makes it hard to answer your question is because, as you know, it depends on the value of the home and how long you've been in the home. Exactly. So if you've been there for a long time, you have this huge difference between what a home is worth and what your assessed value is. So it's a little bit hard to answer that specifically. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, so we have the California Association of Realtors who support this measure and teachers in law enforcement and public unions don't support it. Now I know you can't take sides, you're giving information, but would you be able to just gander as to why teachers would not want this? Well, I think it probably speaks to the fiscal effect on the state. Uh -huh. It doesn't really change the overall funding under our school funding formulas mm -hmm. that go out, but maybe it's because the state has to backfill more. There's less money available that could be used for other purposes. Right, and the suspicion is maybe then the state doesn't backfill to the teacher's needs and law enforcement, et cetera. Exactly. Got it, got it. Well, that's interesting. Let's talk Prop 6. Prop 6, people are probably going to hear a lot about. It deals with transportation taxes. Mm -hmm. The measure itself is relatively straightforward. It, uh, currently, the legislature can only pass a tax. The state legislature can pass a state tax with a two-thirds vote. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to go to the voters, though. Mm -hmm. This measure simply says for transportation taxes, like our gas taxes and diesel taxes, and related vehicle-related taxes, mm -hmm. You, in the future, the legislature has to pass with the two-thirds vote and the voters have to approve those. So oh. it makes it more difficult to pass transportation taxes in the future. Now the second provision is what will get a lot of attention. In 2017, last year, the legislature increased our taxes, mm -hmm. uh, gas taxes, diesel taxes, and others, to raise about $5 billion a year. Mm -hmm. This measure would eliminate those taxes, anything that had been passed after January 1 of 2017. So those taxes would go away if the legislature wanted to reimpose them, they would have to vote again for them and put them before the voters. Got it, so this is the gas tax. This is the gas tax. That was approved in 2017. That said, we're paying a little more, it's about 10, 11 cents per gallon or so. And there's a figure on the screen that will give a, an outline of what the various increases were, but okay. they, they do differ be, between gas, the diesel, diesel and exactly. sales taxes on diesel. Okay. So it's a little more complicated, but yes, the taxes went up. Okay, so then a lot of folks were up in arms about that because it's a, it was another tax as perceived by them, and it was, it was more money. So there have been some changes, and then this was an initiative or more of a legislative act to say, let's bring it in front of folks again? This was an initiative okay. of so people they, that were uh, in effect against those increases. Got it. So they went out and got the signatures and said, let's try this again. Yeah. Okay. So the people for this, the support, we have John Cox, a Republican. We have the Howard Jarvis Association. There's also an organization called Road Builders. And again, the idea is to repeal the fuel tax. Now, would you just go over it again, not the repeal of the fuel tax, but the first part of the tax, the change in terms of the two-thirds? That right now, mm -hmm. the legislature can pass those taxes with a two-thirds vote. Got it. They don't have to go to the voters. Mm -hmm. And now, with this measure, in the future, the legislature can pass it, but they have to submit those to the voters Got for it. the approval. Excellent. Thank you. Proposition 7. Let's talk a little bit about daylight savings. <laughs> Let's shed some light on this. <laughs> Let's shed some light on daylight savings. <laughs> this is a kind of an unusual one. It's not uh -huh. real complicated, but uh, federal law sets our time zones. Mm -hmm. And federal law also sets daylight savings times. Mm -hmm. Between March and November, we leap forward and spring back and, you know, right, all right. that sort of stuff. And most folks may know this, but some might not. But daylight savings time essentially started during World War II as an energy saving measure. That, that was the way it was pitched, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, the California voters back in 1949 mm -hmm. approved daylight savings time. Okay. The people did. 
So what that means is when the people do something through initiative, it can only be changed by having those issues come before the voters again. Right, right. So that is, if we wanted to go off daylight savings time, mm -hmm. you'd have to have the people vote on it. Mm -hmm. That's essentially what is before them now. The measure very simply says that the legislature, with a two-thirds vote, can do whatever they want with the time as long as the federal government allows it. So for example, even though the federal government does not currently allow uh, you to go on daylight savings the entire year, year round, mm -hmm. if they did approve that change, the legislature with a two-thirds vote could go along with that and put California on a year round daylight savings time. Or conversely, it could put us on year round standard time mm -hmm. without us changing our clocks twice a year. Exactly. So it's really just, the measure doesn't do anything by itself because it would require action by the federal government mm -hmm. and then by the legislature. Mm -hmm. And even if that all happened, it's not really clear there'd be a huge fiscal effect on state exactly. and local governments. Exactly. But it would allow us to do things differently than we are now mm -hmm. on our daylight savings. Okay, that was Prop 7. Now let's chat about Proposition 8, which ties into dialysis clinics. Tell me about that, Matt. Well, people with kidney failure or in-stage mm -hmm. renal disease have to do dialysis. They mm -hmm. have to go into a clinic three times a week in order to purify their blood. And these clinics um, are typically nonprofit or profit, and mm -hmm. I think we have a, a visual on the screen that will show you the companies that uh, provide the services. It's dominated by two companies in the state. Um, and these, uh, these services are typically paid for by Medicare the mm -hmm. federal program, uh, but also by, by state funds too, the Medi-Cal program, and by private insurance. Mm -hmm. So it's a variety of funding sources. The measure is a little complicated, but at its essence, it requires these clinics, you can pick any of the ones that we showed you on the screen, to, ba to pay rebates to private providers if their total revenues that they raise are more than 15% more than certain allowable cost. And okay. this gets a little technical about what is mm -hmm. allowable and mm -hmm. what might be included or not. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's an effort to try to limit what some of these firms, these dialysis clinics are making. Um, in doing the fiscal on this, it was very difficult because there's a lot of uncertainties about what expenses might be included in the calculation. Mm -hmm. It's also, there's a lot of uncertainty about how firms, the ones we showed you on the figure, how are they, are they gonna to respond to this measure? Exactly. In some cases, if it limited their, their profits too much, they might cut back operations, they might change their mix of expenses. Mm -hmm. And so, not knowing that, it's a little hard to estimate. It, the impact on state and local governments could range from savings in the tens of millions of dollars a year mm -hmm. to cost in the tens of millions of dollars a year, mm -hmm. depending on some of those uncertainties. Right. And the monitoring of it. So then do we audit their audit? There will have to be, obviously, to enforce it, we'll take uh, resources mm. by the state. Mm. Okay, so Prop 8, it's funded by, or the expenditure to put this on the ballot is funded by the United Healthcare Workers, and they've been trying to unionize dialysis clinics for years. In opposition, we have the California Medical Association, the California Hospital Association, and the American Nurses Association. You mentioned they're primarily two organizations that do, what, 90% of the dialysis? I think in California it's about 70. The, the, I believe the chart will show you, but uh, mm -hmm. two fairly dominant firms. Okay. So, more to be revealed there. I find that somewhat interesting. Now, we would normally go to Proposition 9, which was the initiative to divide California into three states. That has since been pulled off the ballot, so we'll go right to Proposition 10. Tell us about Prop 10, Mac. Probably people think about Proposition 10, or they will talk about it as the rent control related measure. Mm -hmm. um, several cities currently limit, in some ways, what landlords of rental property can charge. Mm -hmm. However, there was a 1995 state law, it's referred to as Costa Hawkins, mm -hmm. that put boundaries on what cities and local governments can do in, in limiting what landlords can charge in three very important ways. You can't limit what you charge when you rent out single family properties, homes. Mm -hmm. You can't limit what can be charged in rent on facilities, housing that was built after 95. Okay. And you can't limit what you charge in rent when a particular um, unit 
is vacated by someone and, and someone new is brought in. So that might have been under some controls, but when you have a new tenant comes in, you can raise the rent, Market rent. and then it's controlled thereafter. Got it. That's Costa Hawkins. That's Got what it. the state restricts locals from doing. This measure simply repeals Costa Hawkins. So that now local governments, if they want, particularly cities, San, yeah, San Francisco, uh, Berkeley, uh, various mm. Bay Areas, mm. and Santa Monica, uh, they would have more ability to control rents on, on housing, single family housing, housing built after 95, uh, and even when uh, someone leaves, they could still control that unit when there's a new tenant coming in. So this measure, uh, I think people will hear a lot about in mm -hmm. the coming campaign. Uh, it will have, if it were approved by the voters, it would have lots of different economic effects. Right. Uh, we estimate that it would probably reduce property taxes and, and probably income taxes. But it could increase some sales taxes because if you have more rent control, uh, individuals more might have more money that, that they could yeah. Exactly, Got exactly. It. So yeah. we think that it would be a net revenue loss to state and local governments. It would depend on how many local governments took advantage of their ability to do greater rent control. Mm -hmm. uh, it could be in the tens of millions of dollars, if not many do it, but it could be in the hundreds of millions of dollars in net revenue losses if a lot of, of uh, city governments did that. Got it. So the supporters here, Coalition for Affordable Housing, Opposition, California Apartment Association, and the California Rental Housing Association. In the actual bill, Mac, does it specify, is it 1%, 2%, 3% in terms of the max, or the states or the, the local municipalities have the ability to, to control it? The locals would control it, and they are governed by a general provision, both in constitutional and case law, that you have to give landlords a fair return mm -hmm. and so this would have to be played out probably in a right. lot of suits Describe on fair. it. Exactly. Exactly. Okay, thank you. Now let's talk about Proposition 11 which essentially allows ambulance workers to have breaks. <laughs> so give us the details. That sounded simple but it's actually <laughs> right. a lot more it's a lot more complicated. Most ambulance services in California are provided through private companies. Mm -hmm. And uh, they obviously hire the emergency, the EMTs, emergency right. medical technicians, and paramedics that man those ambulances. Um, and what's interesting about these ambulance services that in order to make sure that they have coverage, that they can respond in the time necessary, mm -hmm. they move around throughout the day. So that if you have someone responding, when they go to that call, you may reposition the other exactly. ambulance services. Exactly, so they're not in that same purview. Exactly, okay. and they yeah. can respond quickly and cover, handle their coverage area. Currently, and in the past, these, these ambulance employees were always on call, even during rest breaks. So if they're mm -hmm. having, having lunch and they mm -hmm. get a call, they respond. Mm -hmm. And you can sort of understand why. Exactly. And there was a 2016 Supreme Court decision in California. It wasn't on ambulance drivers. It was on security guards. But they said that not requiring people to actually have a lunch break and rest breaks where you're not on call was against California labor law. Mm -hmm. And so we think that right now, if you apply that same logic to ambulance services, mm -hmm. they would have to change the way they operate in order that people would have to have definite rest and meal times. Right, right. This would require more ambulances and higher cost, which would then be reflected in the cost to local governments to provide these services. So what this measure does it says, we're just going to continue our historical practice where these employees will have to be on call, and therefore the services wouldn't incur these costs that we think they're otherwise going to have to incur because of this court decision. And so this measure, if it's approved by the voters, in effect would keep costs lower by allowing this historical practice so of being on call. So I can be on call, I'm having my sandwich, it goes off and I have to go. I have to respond. Now, right. maybe I'll have another period where I can enjoy my lunch or enjoy right. my rest break, but you're not guaranteed it. It would just continue historical practice. And that would result, by, by allowing that historical practice, in effect, this would result probably in some savings to local governments. Got it. Got it. So we have the American Medical Response. That's a large ambulance company who's supporting that. And no opposition to date. So, Mac, let's wrap up with Proposition 12, which talks about confined animals uh, 
in terms of what happens to them while they're confined exactly. and how that transfers into our food. Let's go back to 2008 when the voters approved uh, Proposition 2, and that set various housing standards for egg-laying hens, mm -hmm. for pregnant pigs, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and for calves raised for veal. And this is where people were concerned about confinement, overly right. confined. Right. And it set standards so that these animals would have some room to move around. Mm -hmm. This measure really, you can think of as sort of expanding that and providing even more space. Okay. Um, and also by 2020, if the measure were approved by the voters, you would have in effect cage-free chickens. Mm -hmm. You could designate the total amount of space, but they would not be confined to any one cage. They would in fact roam around within a facility. Got it. And it also requires that other states that we buy products from have to have those same standards. Got it. So it basically is, again, as I say, it would take what the voters passed, but it would take it even further in providing even more space for these types of animals. There could be some small reduction in state mm -hmm. revenues to the extent that if some businesses didn't want to meet those requirements or had higher cost and less mm -hmm. profits mm -hmm. because they had to meet those standards, we don't see a real dramatic fiscal effect, though, on state or local governments. Got it. And is it more in terms of the humane aspect of it, or is what happens when an animal is confined and how adrenaline and, and cortisol are released into the animal and to the meat, et cetera. You know, I, I'm not sure what the proponents of the measure would push, mm -hmm. but I think your first point that it basically speaks to treating the animals in a more humane way that they have mm -hmm. uh, more, more unrestricted movements. Got it. So on that note, the supporter there, primary supporter is Humane Society, and the opposition is the California Association of Egg Farmers and the Humane Farming Association, along with PETA, and friends of animals. So we have covered 11 propositions today. We talked about Proposition 1, which is simply a bond measure that talks to four billion in bonds for housing. We talked about Prop 2, that's the millionaire tax, essentially, and how that money now, with the bond support, will be transferred to homelessness, and ideally prevention, uh, mental health types of things. We also talked about several others, Proposition 3, $9 billion, Proposition 4, a $1.5 billion children's hospital bond fund. And then, Matt, we talked about Proposition 5. Say what that is. The property tax transfer for seniors. Got it. Proposition 6. That's the transportation taxes we'll probably be hearing a lot about. Indeed. Proposition 7, we talked about permanent daylight savings time. And we'll see what happens there. Prop 8, Matt. Proposition 8 is on the dialysis clinics. Again, a complicated one. People probably have to spend a little time fully understanding that one. Indeed. Proposition 10, we're talking about allowing local governments to control the rents in their cities. Proposition 11. Proposition 11 is the ambulance workers and on rest breaks and meals, whether we continue with our past practice or whether we change those to make sure that they have guaranteed rest breaks. Got it. And Proposition 12, please. More housing, uh, more room to move for animals, certain types of animals on farms. Got it. Matt Taylor, state legislative analyst, excellent job as always. I'm William Wesley. We appreciate your time. Use this information to make an intelligent decision about your vote. Thank you. Thank you.